open opportunities for people to come and provoke us, uh, make us think outside of our narrow scientific box, which we have to be in if we're going to do what we do. Uh, but if we're going to take on the challenge of actually trying to link science with policy, science with management, we need to be a little more creative and clever about how we make those translations. Um, and so we're looking for people to spark some of that uh, thinking and creativity. And that's when we thought of uh, Mike Vandenberg, professor of law at uh, Vanderbilt University. And we have some feedback. But, OK. Um, we have a conference call here and a WebEx going on all at the same time. Um, so uh, you know, given that as a background, uh, Professor Vandenberg is uh, well known as a scholar and leader in the area of not only environmental law and energy law, but also in taking formalized legal structures and regulation and combining that and looking at the relationships of, of that with informal social regulation, with free market systems, with the behavior of individuals, the behavior of organizations. And when you mix all that together, uh, how can you get um, better policy um, to, to meet the challenge of adaptive management. Um, and you know, uh, we invited him for, for that reason. Um, his bibliography includes, uh, of course, a lot of publications in the legal review journals. Um, but then you look through it and you say, oh, there's, that's an economics journal. That's a psychology journal. There's a statistics journal. Okay? And then, of course, there's also science, nature, and PNAS. And so the pedigree and the, and the knowledge and the experience that he brings to us is, is, is really great for us. We actually spent a few hours with him yesterday with a number of graduate students uh, going over all this as well. So we really appreciate him coming here. Of course, he didn't get here overnight. Uh, he was raised in Raleigh. Uh, the son of John Vandenberg, uh, former professor, and oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, a former professor and head of the Department of Zoology, and still a very active emeritus professor here at the university. He went down the road to Chapel Hill as a Morgan scholar, uh, earning his BA in zoology and also earning a Phi Beta Kappa and serving as student body president while he was there. Uh, he spent the next year working for former Governor Jim Hunt as a speechwriter, 22 year old speechwriter. Um, before heading up to Washington, D.C. to work in, in private law, and then moving on in the early 90s, working in the President Clinton's transitional team and being chief of staff for the U.S. EPA from 92 to 95, before returning back to private law in one of the largest law firms in, in the world, uh, primarily working in environmental law, before finally getting back to the academy and rising through the ranks from assistant associate full professor at Vanderbilt University and currently uh, serving as a professor um, and also uh, director of the Environmental Law Program and director of Climate Change Research Network. So today he's going to be talking to us about something that I've never heard of before. Uh, uh, and I will let us know how novel and, and new this is, is to the world. Uh, well, let me know, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> but it's actually using prediction markets, which I do know something about, very little in terms of commodities and things like that. But using prediction markets to actually try to influence the opinion and eventually the policies that we have with regard to energy and climate change. So, without further Thank you very much, Thank you. Ask Damien to uh, to do that before any talk I give. He can describe my work better than I can, I think, and I appreciate you you doing that. Um, uh, let me just say that I really enjoyed the last 24 hours. I had a wonderful chance to talk with the, the uh, graduate students yesterday, and I think the program that you all have here is really terrific and, and innovative, and something that uh, I wish we had thought of ourselves. So I want to thank Damien uh, Shea for the invitation. Uh, Jerry McMahon, where's Jerry? There you are. Thank you very much as well. And Aran Sazu, uh, thank you for the arrangements. I think, uh, again, you all have a very impressive uh, program here. And I think where you are is uh, not only on the cutting edge of doing interdisciplinary work, but uh, you know, may have a real impact on the real world, which is something that I care about as a lawyer. Um, let me just say uh, it's uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, some of you just ate. Uh, many of you, like my law students, are in the last row. Um, 
So if you feel yourself nodding off a little bit, uh, I have a story for you. Um, so uh, I was uh, first a lawyer in the era when people were hiring lots of lawyers, uh, which was a while ago. That's not so much the case anymore. And worked with a big uh, Wall Street law firm at a time when the two martini lunch was still a possibility and when recruitment was really active as well. A friend of a friend of mine went out to a uh, long two-hour lunch, which was not unusual at the time, uh, got back to his desk just in time uh, to put his head down and think, well, I'll just sleep for just a second and refresh myself. Uh, luckily, he woke up right before a professor, a professor, now I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> totally in the academy, a, a, a partner at the law firm walked into the office. And so my friend is sitting there, luckily, having just uh, just opened his eyes and he's sitting there and they had this long dialogue and look we're doing some securities work and I want you to do this and we're going to do a debenture here and so on. So, yes I got that okay writing it all down partner gets up walks out of the office my friend relaxes like this and a paper clip falls off his forehead <laughs> So uh, if you are seeing somebody next to you nod off a little bit, please nudge them so I don't see any heads dropping as we go along. Uh, I'll try to talk for a while, but I, I invite you to take uh, questions uh, during my talk. Again, you can't have been a law partner or the EPA chief of staff without being willing to have people talk to you, maybe even yell at you a little bit. So uh, I'm happy to have that, and, and feel free uh, if that works. Um, I, uh, I also want to just say that uh, uh, to fall asleep last night, I was uh, reading a book, took it off the shelf, and this maybe won't surprise you too much knowing now what my background is, but the book was um, about the geology of North and South uh, Carolina, and it opened with a, a chapter-long discussion of plate tectonics. Walked you through the basics, et cetera, and then the complicated geology of particularly the western part of North Carolina, and I was interested in that. But it reminded me of a class that I took. I was actually a zoology and history major at Chapel Hill. I took a Rocks for Jocks class at one point. At least that's what we call it. I don't know if that's appropriate anymore. But um, so we, I, I took this class, and this is, I'm going to date myself, in the early 80s. And there was maybe a two paragraph discussion of this interesting new idea called plate tectonics. Right? Uh, and that's not that long ago. Uh, that's not long ago. Now, uh, an, a garden variety discussion of North Carolina geology has to begin with a chapter of that. And I think that climate science is actually not like that on one level, and it is like that on another. It's not like that in the sense that climate science, of course, began uh, uh, in the 1800s, at least, with thinking initially about the role that burning all this coal would have on, uh, on, uh, on global temperatures. And maybe even if you were in Sweden, thinking that was a good idea. Um, so, so the climate science is, is not, from my perspective, a matter of the much abused term of paradigm shifting, uh, which I think plate tectonics well represents. But I think there are two things that are relevant that I want to talk about. One is that perhaps among the general public, the notion that we can actually affect our environment in such substantial ways and that our household behavior, our industrial behavior, the things, our consumption, the things that we treasure in many ways can have those effects, maybe that is something a little bit closer to a paradigm shift in the way we look at our lives. And then what I want to talk about is a project that I'm working on. I'm working on a book, and what you're going to hear today, if you read the paper, what you'll see is a, uh, an article that will come out in the UCLA Law Review in the spring, but will be rewritten into a chapter in a book. And here's the notion, and I'm going to make the bold claim that I'm, I'm thinking this is something close to a paradigm shift, at least as it comes to law and policy. And that is this. When I say climate change, and we perhaps need a response to it, what do you immediately think of? Okay, I'm, I'm going to hear what I want to hear, which is government, right? What can government do about that? You can look at, you can look at, that's the nice thing about being a law professor. I can make up any answer I want to. Uh, so I think about, if you go back and look at almost any undergraduate environmental policy text, it will say there are six or seven collective action problems and all kinds of different reasons why when we get to the bottom of the analysis, we need a solution. And that solution is government, right? And what is that government solution? It is regulation. It is statutory change, et cetera. Right? And it's embedded in our vocabulary. For example, uh, who is somebody who makes policy? A policymaker. Do you think of a policymaker as being the CFO of a company uh, or the uh, chair of the board of a private uh, organization? I don't think so. Right? Uh, when we think about what needs to happen on a global level, we talk about international negotiations. We have embedded into our vocabulary the idea that it's nations that must negotiate with one another to solve the problem. And what I want to argue today is that what you'll see here is one small piece of a bigger project, which is all about saying the actor need not be government and the action need not be regulation. The point is not that those are not ultimately necessary. I believe they are, unequivocally. 
Uh, but the point is that if we limit ourselves to thinking about the actor as government and the action as some sort of regulation, we are now locked into all the tools of government. We're locked into the checks and balances. We're locked into political capture. And we're locked into all the other functions uh, of government. And what I want to argue is that if we need to move quickly to begin to bend down the carbon growth curve, we need to conceptually move out of the mindset that it is only government that can be responsive. Again, not that government is not necessary, but it's not the only tool. So that's the, the thrust of what I want to talk about. And you can decide for yourself whether it's a paradigm shift, and maybe we can do some kind of voting if you do that or something of that nature, uh, but, but we'll see. So uh, I went to a conference at the Radcliffe Institute about six weeks ago, and I saw a new kind of norm among researchers. Maybe this is common among those of you who are scientists, but this was a group of uh, neuroeconomists and cognitive uh, psychologists, and uh, they each had a little picture of their graduate students uh, on the slides early on. They were introducing this. Is that a, a common norm? I'm going to suggest. Yes, okay. So in law, we don't do that. We don't give anybody else credit, right? We take all the credit ourselves. But let me try a little bit to start with this new norm, and maybe it will spread among law professors. This is my colleague, Jonathan Gilligan, who has a PhD in physics from Yale, studied uh, ozone depleters and so forth, and is, has helped me a lot with this. He also, by the way, uh, uh, is a, uh, a playwright uh, and uh, just a multi-talented guy, uh, someone that I think would be fun for some of you all to work with as well. Uh, I'll pass over this guy in the middle. On the right, uh, again, you remember, I, I grew up as an NC State fan, watched David Thompson, the best basketball team ever, went to Carolina. So I have now hired a postdoc from, um, can I say it, from Duke? Uh, so she is a PhD in Duke. You may have seen her research recently. She had uh, a piece out with the timing of the release. This was beautiful. It was on belief superiority, the notion that those who are at the polar ends of the spectrum actually believe more strongly in their views. They only have, not, not only have, do they have more polarized views, they believe more strongly in them, and they released that study right in the middle of the budget shutdown. So uh, it, was, it was very timely. It got covered in NPR and major news media, et cetera. She has... Is that a response to the last comment? We, we can't hear it hardly at all. Uh, okay, I'll try to stand closer to the phone. So far, you haven't missed anything, so you're good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, so this is the team, and this is an example of some of the kind of teams we put together. I'm going to just say a word or two more about uh, what we do. We have the Climate Change Research Network. We do not have the kind of systemic funding that you have. We're working against that disadvantage. We have been successful at, at receiving grant money and, and in generating the intellectual interest necessary to produce projects you can't see from where you are, which allows me to describe whatever I want to about this. But this basically says uh, we have social psychologists, political scientists, economists, engineers, uh, natural scientists, uh, and a whole range of different people working together. And the theme is uh, household behavior, uh, corporate behavior, and the intersection of law and policy and the other fields. So how does law change behavior of corporations and individuals, not just by commanding behavior through the way we learn in seventh grade civics, but by making information available, by shifting social norms, by activating personal norms, et cetera. And that's a theme that ties together a lot of the work that we, uh, we do here. Um, and it's all a part of the Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and Environment, which is headed by George Hornberger, who is an engineer and a hydrologist uh, and has, uh, has been really added a great deal of energy uh, to our program. So that's, that's where uh, I'm coming from here. And again, I, I've learned a lot already about what you're doing here, and I, I hope we have a chance to work together more in the future because I think we're trying to achieve a lot of the same things. So just to give you some examples, uh, you heard more, I'm not going to on this, but we're trying to do a whole range of different pieces of work across different disciplinary lines, uh, ranging from thinking about the importance in economics of uh, thinking about the opportunity cost of always assuming that what you need to pursue is the first best option and ignoring the idea that the timing of being able to adopt that option because of politics might influence whether it's the first best option in the first place. Uh, that's essentially the first place, the paper. This next paper, the 1% problem, essentially makes this argument. Um, we tend to, if you've ever been in Washington, and some of you on the phone, I think, uh, have, are at Interior, you know that day in and day out, one group after another comes to you and says, don't regulate me. I'm only 1% of the problem. Right? Don't regulate me. I'm only... Well, what we did is we said, okay, let's assume that we take away all the countries in the world that can argue that they're only 1% of the global climate problem. What are you left with? Right? You're left with about two-thirds of the emitters. You've just lost a third of the emitters. And the same is true for almost any industry sector. Depending on how you play with that denominator, almost anybody with the climate problem can argue, I'm only 1%. So essentially what we're saying is we have a 1% problem when it comes to climate. We've got to think about some other way to deal with this phenomenon of treating 1% as if it were de minimis. Uh, so that's just examples of some of the kinds of things uh, that we have underway with different groups of people. So I made the point earlier on that we shouldn't just think about government 
as the, uh, as the only actor that can move. And when it comes to climate, I want to make the argument that we are still, most of us, too optimistic that government will move in the near term. And what you see here, on some level, is so obvious I need not say it. And uh, let me just say a word about, Damien mentioned that I publish in law journals and science journals. Uh, many of you may not know, law journals are edited by student editors. Right? So uh, the feedback I got on one paper at one time was, if this idea is as big as you say it is, it would have already been published. <laughs> Which may explain why a lot of people think a lot of uh, legal scholarship is pretty trivial. The big ideas would have already been published. So in any event, that may be true for this. Who knows? But let me at least argue, make the argument. My argument is that in the first two decades of environmental law and policy, we had almost two dozen major pollution control statutes, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Superfund, RICRA, TSCA, et cetera. Okay? How many have we had since 1990? Right? Now, some of you may have worked on the Food Quality Protection Act or the FIFRA amendments of 1996 or the rifle shot amendments to get uh, scrap dealers out of the Superfund statute that occurred in the late 1990s. But are any of those major? I would argue not. I would argue that by any standard, we have had no major pollution control statutes in the last two plus decades. Right? And yet we still treat environmental law and policy as a positive law field, as we would call it in my age. It's an area that's driven by statutes and regulations. If that's true, although there is a lot of regulatory activity, you can see that with the mobile source standards from EPA and the, and the stationary store standards from EPA, in terms of statutory enactment, none in the last 23 years, in terms of major statutory enactments. Okay? That is not necessarily like with your stock por portfolio, the case that past performance is predictive of future performance. Right? Maybe all of a sudden we will get that. But maybe there's something more fundamental going on. Maybe the future of environmental law and policy is not as statutory driven as the past was. And maybe yet most of us were trained in an era when, as I did, I was taught that environmental law field essentially is a subfield of administrative law. It's about regulations and statutes and courts interpreting them and citizen suits enforcing them, et cetera. Right? And my argument in this paper and many others is maybe that's not true moving forward. Maybe environmental law and policy should look somehow different. And I think that should inform the kind of research questions we do in social science, sometimes in natural science, and how we use all that uh, to deal with the climate problem. So uh, I have a whole series of papers uh, on this notion of private governance. Um, and uh, the piece you're going to see today, as I mentioned, is uh, coming out as an article. But it's also part of a broader project. And, and the project is a book that right now I'm calling Beyond Gridlock. Uh, and the idea is uh, we are in gridlock at the international level and at the national level when it comes to climate. Uh, and that we're beginning to see some recognition in the scholarship that the first best solution, which is to price carbon on a global level, is unlikely to occur in time. And if that's true, what else might we do? And my argument is we can use a whole bunch of different private initiatives, not to solve the problem, but to give some time, to buy some time for government to begin to act. And that's the nature of it. This paper you're going to see today is one element uh, of, that, of that project. These are papers with an economist, uh, with uh, Tom Dietz, who's a sociologist at Michigan State, Paul Stern, who's a, a social psychologist at the National Research Council, uh, and a range of different uh, co-authors along the way. Matt Kotchin, who is an economist at the Yale Forestry School. So, uh, so what do I mean by private, uh, uh, private governance? First, let's talk about pu public governance. As I mentioned at the outset, we just assume when we think about government, uh, uh, we mean the uh, federal government. We think about policymakers, laws and regulations. And again, we use the term international to refer to this idea that nations will negotiate and produce a comprehensive uh, carbon price through a carbon tax or, uh, or some kind of cap and trade system. Um, my argument instead is that we can think about uh, private governance, by which I mean that private institutions, meaning non-governmental institutions, uh, pursue traditionally governmental ends. Uh, protecting the uh, exploitation of common pool resources, reducing negative externalities, producing public goods, uh, affecting the distribution of environmental goods between different populations, and that they also are serving governmental functions, uh, standard setting, standard modification, implementation, enforcement, uh, financing, adjudication. Example, if you buy a fresh-caught fish 
at a Sam's Club, uh, the largest grocer in North America right now. If you would buy a fresh caught fish at a, a Sam's Club in North America today, that fish will come with an MSC label on it. That label means that it has been caught pursuant to the standards of the Marine Stewardship Council, which is a non-governmental organization formed initially by a combination of a, a European fish seller and the World Wildlife Fund, which sets private standards for the extraction of fish. All right. If you go uh, buy a uh, McFish a fish fillet at, at McDonald's, uh, what you will get is a a sandwich uh, where the fish has been caught through the MSC standards. Okay, uh, is that a governmental body? There's very little relationship to government. There is a floor there that they rely on, but otherwise it's a private institution, and that private institution regulates roughly seven to ten percent of all the fish caught um, uh, for human consumption in the world today. Okay. Uh, is it displacing government? Is it complementing government? What is it doing? We could argue about that, but that's an example of what private governance means. 15, 14 to 15 percent of all forests and temperate countries are governed by the FSC standards as well. Do they work? Do they not work? We could argue about that, but it's a growing phenomenon out there. Okay, so as to climate, my argument again is not that private governance will, uh, will be enough, that somehow it will solve the problem, but that it might buy some time for us to see these other kinds of governmental actions uh, uh, to, to move into place. I argue here that um, one thing that private uh, governance can do through a market potentially is to assess the accuracy of the climate science, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, another that it, thing that it can do is potentially motivate support. Uh, and what I want to do is argue that views of the climate science are central to views of climate mitigation. And what many of us in the law and policy world do is we skip a step. We move either from the raw science, we move right from the raw science, into saying, well, now what, what can government or some other institution do about that? And my argument is private governance can play a role in that critical intermediary step, which is, is a sufficient part of the public motivated, given whatever barriers exist, to do something about it? And, and again, that's what this, this paper is all about. Uh, so, uh, something that you all know uh, quite well, which is the IPCC has issued a series of reports over time. One nice thing about working with a uh, legitimate scientist like a physicist is that, although I had a little line down here, he made me take it off, uh, because there isn't really a number in the 1990 report. And as a lawyer, I was thinking, well, I'm going to sort of estimate what that is. And he's like, no, 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 come on, you can't do that. So there's no line here. But, but what they say in the 1990 report is there's some observed warning. We get to, uh, to the mid-90s, and now it's the balance of the evidence, which we assume to be 50% plus. There is actually not a number in the IPCC report as to whether or not climate change is mostly anthropogenic. Now we're finally getting uh, likelihoods as we go to the three later reports, 66 to 90% likely, then very likely, now extremely likely in the uh, draft uh, assessment for policymakers, which just was released in September. So you see uh, what's happening over time. Uh, so what do we know about public opinion? Right, what do we know about public opinion? Uh, okay, these are data uh, uh, based on Gallup data from, um, from uh, McWright, who is a sociologist at, uh, Aaron McWright, who's a sociologist at Michigan State. And uh, what he shows you is that as to Democrats, uh, uh, belief that climate change is anthropogenic uh, roughly has been at 70%, small variations, is where it has been all along. As the climate science has gotten more certain, Democrats haven't changed their view. 30% of them still don't think that climate change is anthropogenic. Okay? And, of course, Republicans during the same time started out at about 50%, right? And uh, have gone down over time to now 30%. So that's 70% of Republicans now, despite the increasing certainty expressed by the IPCC, do not believe that climate change is anthropogenic. Okay? So, of course, again, as a lawyer, I'm not willing to let something go without really pounding it into the ground. I put the two together. We're combining apples and oranges a little bit, um, but the, uh, the trend is obvious. More science, more certainty in the science, less certainty on net in the population. Okay? So, as a scientist, you can say, well, uh, if we just reframed it, if we called it global warming instead of climate change, uh, if we just got that next report out, maybe we could get somewhere. And I, I'm, I'm supportive of more. Uh, but my argument is when you look at these kind of numbers, it's hard to argue that more of the same thing is going to do the trick. If what you want is to close the gap between expert beliefs and public beliefs, and maybe you think we shouldn't do that. If you think there should be some correlation between those two, uh, then my argument is maybe it's worth taking some risk to do something a little bit different. Okay, so what we did uh, working um, with... Uh, with Caitlin Toner, who's our social psychologist, to try to unpack a little bit about what the science is on doubting in America. What is it about uh, climate science that leads us 
uh, to doubt uh, uh, the climate science. Who, who doubts and, and how does all that work? Um, and I, I don't want to dwell on this at great length, but essentially the way I look at it as a lawyer, the, what the social psychology says is that we pick a worldview. Right? We, ha we, ha we arrive with a worldview, and then we go out and use motivated reasoning to find facts that support that worldview. Okay? And that is uh, sometimes called confirmation bias, which has been thought of as one of the best uh, established of the social psychological phenomena about receipt of information, uh, and we see this all over the place. So uh, what happens then is that conservatives, moderates, and liberals differ quite a bit about core values, about what is desired in social structure and autonomy versus equality. If you've seen Dan Cahan's work from Yale, you've seen some of this kind of work. He talks about uh, worldviews. I talk about worldviews. He has different terminology for it. But the, the idea is the same. Um, and what's interesting is that then people come at the climate science with deeply different worldviews, and then they go select the facts that work for them. And I heard this described very well, I thought, by um, Jonathan Haidt, who is an NYU uh, business school uh, psychologist, and he described it as changing your perspective from what should I believe or what can I believe to what must I believe. And if your, belief, if your approach is what must I believe, then you're going to look for all those things that will help you not have to believe something you don't want to. And that's what we all do on a whole range of different topics. Here we're talking about climate change. So maybe one answer is ratchet up the threat language. But we also know from the psychology that when people feel threatened, they retreat into their own groups. When they retreat into their own groups, they tend to form an echo chamber, and they, they bolster each other. So more threat, not clear that that's uh, the answer. It's also quite clear that people are getting their climate science from many different sources, and deeply different sources depending on where people are on the climate uh, uh, belief spectrum, and that those who are getting uh, uh, information from sources that treat climate change as uh, uncertain tend to believe more that it's uncertain. It's also not the fact that people who know less or are less interested are, uh, or are somehow um, less certain about the climate science. There's a reverse correlation there in the sense that people who know more and pay more attention to climate science news are more skeptical. Uh, so it's a, it's a genuine problem. Here what we do is we're focusing on doubters. Uh, if you look at Anthony Lizerowitz's work with Ed Maybach, you know that 7 or 8% of the population is deeply skeptical, and they make up a very high percentage of all those little blog responses. If you ever look at AccuWeather or whatever, and you see someone immediately when a climate story comes out, there's someone in there who says, well, no, there are 10 sources of data that say that you're full of it. The 7 or 8% of the population is scouring the blogs at any given time. Everything I'm talking about here is not about that. I don't think what I'm talking about will have much effect there. What I'm thinking about is moderates, uh, uh, conservatives who are doubters, uh, but maybe aren't totally shut down on, on receiving information about climate. And, uh, and uh, why does any of this matter from a law and policy perspective? What you believe about climate very likely affects, particularly whether government, but also whether private governance might affect uh, the priority that you give to mitigation. Um, and whether or not you think urgency uh, is warranted or not. Okay, so we then go in and we look at the literature a little bit and we unpack somewhat uh, where some of the doubt is coming from. And we see two themes, there are many of them out there, but these are two that we're focused on. Uh, one is concerns about the accuracy that many of the people in this room fit into a group of scientists who are all engaging in groupthink. Uh, what people are really out there to do is to gain more research grants, uh, to gain a bigger reputation, um, and that, uh, that, that uh, as a result of that, uh, data are being ignored and studies are being excluded from the peer-reviewed literature as a result of that. And that, that's a common theme, a concern I think of about the accuracy. Is the science right in and of itself? And then secondly is the question about the source, the credibility of the source of the information. Uh, what we see is that much of the climate science comes from scientists who are government funded and is produced and, and compiled by governmental or quasi-governmental agencies, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Climate Research Program, and other governmental sources. Uh, those tend to be right, not that credible to many of the people who are doubters. Now, one thing that's interesting is that private institutions have made a number of public statements about climate change as well. And if you are a free trade advocate or free market advocate, you might think that those institutions' information would be the most persuasive. Uh, but they don't seem to have had a big impact on belief so far. And I want to show you uh, some examples. So as a result of the fact that this hasn't seemed to have had much of an effect, what we're suggesting here is that uh, a market, a prediction market, might be uh, potentially valuable as a way to signal the accuracy of the climate science 
and that it might also be credible to the community that is most doubting right now. Um, but what's interesting, when we actually dug into the literature, and from my perspective, this is an example of why uh, it's worthwhile if you're um, a social science or maybe even a natural science uh, a researcher to work with a lawyer sometimes. Right? So until we actually went looking to think about the, the policy relevance of the literature, we didn't uncover this notion that there's a lot of literature on the fact that, um, that folks on the conservative end of the spectrum view a policy instrument that is free market based as being a, a, a valuable tool. But if you ask, well, do they also see markets as accurate signals of information more than folks on the other end of the spectrum? There's actually very little about that out there. And I would argue that is a hole in what we're doing right now. It's an area we hope to do some more research on. Do folks who see free markets as the right answer as a policy tool also view them more credibly as an information signal? I think that's plausible enough that it's worth proceeding with this. But if you don't, I'm happy to take questions on that. And we have some research that we plan to do to try to tease that out a little more. It's the kind of question that didn't even occur until we went looking with this question in mind. Okay, so what, what are private... Uh, what is the private marketplace telling us already about the likelihood of climate change? Um, so uh, I went to look at the annual energy outlook of Exxon, right? And what do they say? Exxon says that in 2030, uh, two decades from now, after we know a lot more about the climate science, that we should expect that there will be a $60 a ton uh, on the price of carbon dioxide equivalents in industrialized countries, in OECD countries. Exxon says that a decade later, the OECD countries will have increased um, that price per ton to $80 a ton. Okay? So there's Exxon. Uh, you all may have read about the reinsurance companies, Munich Re, Swiss Re, those that will absorb some of the greatest losses. And you'll see if you go to their websites that uh, they're unequivocal about their views that, that anthropogenic climate change is happening. Uh, when it looked like we might get a cap and trade bill, the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, or U.S. CAP, was formed. It included two dozen of the largest U.S. firms, firms like Chrysler, GE, DuPont, and others, and expressed support for the idea that anthropogenic climate change was happening and that a cap and trade system was an appropriate policy response. Uh, if you just go around and look uh, on the web today, you'll see all kinds of companies announcing uh, carbon emissions reduction goals. And again, in many of these cases, that doesn't necessarily mean that the company is making a statement about anthropogenic climate change. It could be that what they're doing is responding to inappropriate government attempts to mitigate and trying to best position themselves economically in relation to that. You have to account for that. But nevertheless, Hewlett Packard has, has announced a goal of 20% emissions reductions. Uh, Walmart has, is working to reduce the emissions reductions of its supply chain. It has been insisting on a 20% emissions reduction from its largest Chinese suppliers. Walmart has 10,000 suppliers in China. It would be roughly the sixth largest country trading with China if it were a country. Uh, so you think about what UN or US policy in relation to China has had a bigger effect on Chinese emissions than Walmart insisting on its suppliers not making products at lower prices but with lower energy use or lower carbon emissions. Okay? Uh, Microsoft recently announced carbon neutrality. They've actually imposed within Microsoft a carbon tax. So if you propose to take a trip or something of that nature, your, your office is charged a carbon tax within Microsoft itself as a way to help it efficiently move its carbon emissions toward carbon uh, neutrality. So there are just some examples. The point of all this, though, in part, is that almost none of this has reached the public more generally. Many of you already may know this, but uh, until I looked, I didn't know this. And it certainly hasn't changed the graphs that I showed you before about where a uh, belief in anthropogenic climate change is headed. So that leaves us with uh, the option I want to talk about in more detail, which is would it make sense to establish a private uh, climate prediction market? Uh, I mean private not in the sense that a group of qualified investors who are wealthy could trade among each other. That's another term of private. I'm using private in the sense of non-governmental. Did you have a question? No, sorry. Uh, so um, so non-governmental, why do I suggest non-governmental? For all the same reasons that we don't uh, now have more statutory or national action on climate. Very likely, if you expected government to do this, it would take a long time if it could be done at all. But nevertheless, markets can be established by private entities. What might we trade? We might trade uh, uh, some kind of contract or future, which I'll talk more about, in global mean surface temperature. We might not pick a particular year, right? We might pick a band of years, 2020 to 2030 or 2020 to 2025, to try to avoid the occasional volcano or other event of that nature that would skew the numbers. Uh, we might pick a sea level increase. We might pick uh, some kind of measure of heat waves or droughts or temperature in Greenland, perhaps, to focus attention there. Uh, we might pick ocean pH over time. 
remarkably little attention given its importance. Uh, for a market like this to work, uh, it would need to have specificity uh, so that we could reduce disputes over precisely who won or lost. Uh, we would need to know, for example, what the database was that was, was going to be the basis on which we decided who won. Uh, we would also need clarity uh, because uh, the function of this market is not just to reallocate resources, but rather to signal information. And so if the bets are so complicated that you, uh, you need someone in this room to, to unpack them, it's unlikely that, that the market would serve the function that at least I'm thinking of. Um, we can talk more about specific kinds of instruments that could be used. Uh, would it be considered an option or a future or an event contract? Um, and, but what, what we're doing here is not really trying to propose a specific type of market, but to say that the literature suggests that there are enough types of instruments out there that we might be able to do much of what we're trying to accomplish here. The same with the kind of market mechanism. What would the role of the market be? Would it be a market maker, and exactly how would that work? That's not the focus so much of what we're doing here, but rather to argue that this ought to be the focus uh, of an effort, and then there are enough types of market mechanisms and enough experience to suggest that this is plausible. In the near term, uh, the regulatory constraints are such that probably the best model for the market we're talking about is the Iowa Electronics Markets uh, model. Some of you may have participated in that. You can bet up to $500 on presidential elections. So uh, you can take uh, Romney for, you know, for 10 or something like that. You can take Obama for whatever. Uh, if you're still betting on that, you know, we should talk. But, um, <laughs> but uh, though that market has been remarkably, uh, remarkably successful at, at predicting the number of electoral votes that candidates would get. And it's been used in other areas as well, despite the fact as I know from having participated uh, in, in the policy world, that there's a huge advantage to being able to signal that you're winning that market. Uh, so there's a lot of incentive for manipulation, but this has been a very effective market. In the long term, to achieve the kind of uh, information signaling function that we'd like to achieve, it would be more valuable if we had much more of a robust traditional market of some sort, and we can talk about different alternatives to do that. But I think uh, from a legal constraint perspective, that would be very hard to do uh, in the very near term. So we're focused more on the short term right now. And I'm not the first one, we're not as a team the first ones, to uh, argue that some kind of prediction market should occur. Uh, Dan Kahan uh, mentioned this in a blog. Roger Pilkey Jr. has mentioned it. Nate Silver in his uh, 360 uh, blog, whatever, what is it, 560, yeah. Uh, uh, he, uh, I'm not a mathematician, as you can tell. So he, um, uh, he, he has mentioned it as well. I think we're the first to synthesize this together and to understand what its relationship is to uh, the social psychology and the, and, the, and the policy of doubting in America. Okay. Uh, as you all know, if you follow uh, some of this literature, uh, there have been many bets in the past, and this is one other potential approach. Uh, you learn in undergraduate school, or at least if you read uh, the, the literature, the famous bet between uh, Paul Ehrlich and Julian Simon about a series of five medals where Ehrlich had to write a $576.07 check because he lost the bet. That's become almost iconic in the literature uh, among those who uh, are doubters about the, the idea that there might be limits on commodities. The economist who's across the hall from me tells me that the, the problem there was that uh, Ehrlich picked metals for which there were markets, and the challenge with something like CO2 is there is no market out there, so that the, 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 uh, the likelihood that he would have won that bet on some other set of, of items is, uh, is, is uh, quite great. Uh, there was a recent climate bet between uh, uh, James Anon and, uh, and two Russian solar physicists, and what they bet on was that the global surface temperatures for the 1998-2003 period versus uh, surface temps for 2012 to 2017 um, would, uh, would rise. And if the temperature does rise over the interval, then um, the, the Russian solar scientists pay Anon $10,000. If the temperature drops during the interval, Anon wins. Uh, and they agreed on data from the U.S. Climate uh, Data Center, so they, there would be some limited amount of dispute over it. Uh, so that's one example of what's gone on already. Again, the sort of one-off betting has not so far been enough to have any effect on the, on the dial of public opinion. You uh, may also be familiar with the famous bet between Lindzen and Nahn, which never really came off, uh, but they fought over the question about exactly what were they betting on. Um, and ultimately, uh, Anon says, wait, uh, if you really unpack Lindzen's bet, he only thinks there's a 2% chance he's right. Uh, and Lindzen says, no, 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 you don't even understand what I'm betting here. And my point as a lawyer is I can't understand it. 
and I can't understand it, is it likely to move the public dial? I don't think so. What does that suggest about what a market would have to do? Again, it would have to have sufficient clarity that reports on that market would likely have an effect on public understanding of the accuracy of the climate science. Okay, we also know from, uh, from the literature and from common parlance that phrases such as, such as put your money where your mouth is or put up or shut up are actually quite powerful. There is a deeper psychology on this as well. Uh, people uh, believe strongly that they, they have to be cautious about making public commitments and, um, and they want to look and be consistent with those public commitments and they expect others to act in accordance with their statements. Uh, what we're seeing in the healthcare debates right now is just one recent example of how important what your prior statement was and how much people will, will hold you to that. Bets are also sometimes seen as powerful commitments um, and may uh, reduce doubters' perceptions of science if the scientists are willing to put their money where their mouth is. The problem with this as a systemic solution is, again, it doesn't reach that many people and it can be really confusing. So... Uh, there have been some uh, markets that have formed over time in, um, in climate prediction. And, uh, and so uh, I want to just describe, this is small for those of you in the back too, uh, and, and light, but uh, let me just describe a little bit. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, this is Intrade, which is no longer uh, in business in the United States. It was essentially put out of business by the Commodity Future Trading Commission. Um, but you could buy, uh, buy this, and this is a, a, a page from their website. And what were they offering? Uh, they were offering a binary contract. It paid $10 if the particular condition occurred and nothing if it did not. And, um, and uh, this, uh, this situation here is just an example of, of one of those contracts that they were offering. And at this point, uh, the event uh, is listed up here. The, the question was, will 2019 be a warmer year than 2009? And at the time this market shut down uh, not too long ago, the, it was trading at a level which was $7.50 for a $10 instrument, which effectively you can translate to mean that there was the market thought there was a 75% probability that 2019 would be the warmer year. Okay, And that's an example of how these kind of markets can work. We can talk about why this was shut down. It gives you an example of why it would be hard to do a market like this now, given the regulatory constraints that are out there. If you, uh, if you live in New Zealand or outside the United States, you could participate in iPredict. Um, and they have a series of, uh, of contracts that are available out there about sea level rise. Um, and uh, the problem is, if you trade within the United States, you're subject to the jurisdiction of the CFTC and the SEC, and so you have a problem. Uh, now, you don't have so much of a problem, but the IFI predict would if they tried to offer you the securities in the United States. Uh, but again, this, this can be done. A challenge is this is a pretty thinly traded market, um, and so that, that's an issue here. Um, so uh, what we're thinking about is... Number one, that the market that we're talking about would be an effort to try to examine the accuracy of the climate science. What if the, uh, the, the uh, doubters are correct? What if climate scientists are acting in a way that is simply reflecting some, uh, some bias among the field, some desire for research uh, grants, whatever it might be? Uh, are markets successful at... Uh, at aggregating and communicating information that is outside of the common wisdom. Uh, and I think the answer from the literature suggests that they, they're quite good at that, that markets are essentially uh, blind as to the source of information, but that many markets have been successful in the past at reflecting very quickly uh, the state of information, whether it was within the common wisdom uh, or not. Uh, to achieve that, you very likely would need a liquid market. You need to have a lot of participants. Uh, there would need to be a clear dispute that could be resolved prior to maturity, and it would have to be easily resolved. You couldn't have a 10-year litigation, despite my best wishes as a lawyer, uh, about trying to resolve who won. Um, a key, again, I'm not an economist. As best I can tell from looking at the literature on markets, it seems as though a key is that what you want is the marginal trader to be profit-seeking. So it's, it's okay if uh, you have the presidential election market and there are some pure Romney fans in there will buy Romney no matter what and some pure Obama fans, but you want that marginal trader to be seeking profit. And when that happens, it seems as though many of these markets uh, are successful aggregators of information. Um, then uh, the question would be, uh, would a signal of that information have credibility uh, among doubters? 
And uh, again, our argument is not that we think skeptics are likely to be persuaded by this, but that moderates and conservatives might be more responsive to a market signal than would be um, uh, than they would be to government reports and 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 even well-framed ones. But again, as I mentioned before, there is a gap here. We we know that conservatives respond to markets as policy instruments. We don't know whether they view markets as more credible sources of information. And so we're we're looking at that. So all this could occur, but it wouldn't matter at all if it's just a tree falling in the woods. So could it be communicated? Uh, one answer is that we might see media accounts of the price of these markets. There were some media accounts of iTrade, uh, or Intrade rather, when it existed. Uh, and there have been media accounts of the Iowa election market as well. Um, Ultimately, if you had a market that was sufficiently robust, you might get uh, the Wall Street Journal each day electronically or in paper, and you open your securities table, and perhaps the, you know, the likelihood that temperature will be higher in 2020 will be one of the things that you can look at in your stock table, for example. It obviously wouldn't be a stock. Um, and then, uh, as well, it could be a tool that could be used in policy debates. Someone could say, put your money where your mouth is. I'll sell you a future for X. I'll put $100,000 uh, on the sea level in 2025. Uh, and that, in turn, could get communicated. We know from the literature that uh, much of what people know about climate science occurs from what they hear in the media about policy debates about the climate science. And so if this were a tool, it might be valuable in policy debates as well, as well as just the average individual over the dinner table, in effect, hearing about it. Okay, I'll wrap up in just, uh, just a minute. Uh, so uh, there are a whole range of different potential instruments that are out there. Um, you can use winner-take-all contracts, uh, as we, we, just, uh, we just talked about, where the contract sells for a specific amount and it only pays off if that event occurs. There are also index contracts, um, which are a related phenomenon, where the, the contract payoff varies based on the rising or falling of a particular number, such as uh, Iowa uh, market, the percentage of the vote. See, there are also what are called spread contracts as well. It's not our, our goal here to propose a very specific market, but rather to say that there are enough tools out there uh, that we think that uh, a, a climate market is feasible. Uh, similarly, with the type of market mechanism, uh, many markets function on what's sometimes called a continuous double auction, and we think it's likely that that would be a value here. The market is constantly matching orders in queue, uh, but uh, the concerns are you need a lot of liquidity for that. And so if we had a thinly traded market, that could be problematic. It could function more like a paramutual market where you put all your money into a pool and then the pool goes to the trader that has the winning uh, prediction. It's what you do in a, in a horse race, for example. And the challenge here is that it has a limited incentive if you use that structure to trade early. And if this is going to work, it's not going to work because we're all going to wait around until 2030 and decide, ah, I was right. What will matter is what the value of that instrument is between now and 2030, the signal of that. How much do you think you could buy it or sell it to someone else before 2030, not uh, whether it actually pays off in the final analysis. And that's, that's a challenge. Uh, so we do have these, uh, these long-term issues from a legal perspective, which I know is what you all came to talk about. So I try to, I'm going to try to reference some statutory sections here and all that. There are a couple people who are not yet asleep in the back, and this will do it, I think. So um, uh, the Commodity Exchange Act is what regulates most of the behavior in this area. Uh, it it uh, authorizes the establishment of and governs the behavior of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the CFTC. Uh, and the CFTC is quite aggressive, particularly after the financial meltdown of 2008 and 2009, quite aggressive, um, and after the Dodd-Frank Act, at, at, uh, at narrowing down investors' potential risks out there for these kinds of instruments. So it's, it's a dangerous area right now and worse than it was five years ago. But they do have the power to accept contracts to promote innovation and fair competition if they're in the public interest. So I know it wouldn't be in the public interest to try to better inform the public about the greatest challenge of our generation, but I'm going to make the argument anyway. That's a joke, and what I do in class, <laughs> what I do in class, I just raise my hand if the kids don't get the joke, and then uh, they know to laugh. That makes me feel better. So, uh, okay, so we get the, the Commodity Exchange Act, and uh, it's, it's uh, been modified by the Dodd-Frank Act, which gave the CFTC authority over event contracts. So you can, you can bet over uh, the box office receipts, for example, uh, in Hollywood, or who's going to win the Oscars, et cetera. Those kinds of instruments now the CFTC has regulatory authority over, and it's been quite aggressive at uh, shutting down these kinds of contracts in many cases. Uh, and particularly, it worries that something might be more like gambling than investing. 
uh, unless it has an economic purpose. And it could have an economic purpose by providing a hedging function or what's called a price-basing utility function, giving something a price that doesn't otherwise have a price. The question here is, well, what's the underlying asset if we need an underlying asset? It's only an outcome, right? It's not like a pork belly where we're trading something and there's, a, there's an asset underneath it. So we have some work to do, uh, but there is, there is an, an, an out in the event we're worried about this, which is uh, that CFTC does, uh, allow, uh, is authorized to, to make this exception that I mentioned before, that if you're going to promote innovation and fair competition in the public interest, uh, the CFTC can allow you to operate. And that's how the Iowa election market operates. It has a no-action letter from the CFTC, which doesn't say something is but it says we won't enforce you even if we think it might be illegal, which for all intents and purposes does a lot of good for the, for the Iowa election market. So the University of Iowa is running this market. Uh, what were the conditions on that letter? The maximum trade is $500. Uh, you can have no more than 2,000 traders, so there's some limits there. Uh, it must be conducted primarily for research and education, and you can't compensate the directors. Uh, if you meet those conditions, then you can operate under this, this no-action letter, and we can imagine that uh, a market operating in this way would be a good first step. And given that there's already one no-action letter, it seems plausible that, that another one might be achieved if this market were set up. A concern, so far, uh, the Iowa market has had plenty of liquidity. That has not been a problem. And it has been remarkably accurate as well. It's the subject of a lot of literature, which we could, we could talk more about. Okay, uh, again, I've talked about other markets. Um, they're out there. We don't need to, to spend more time on that. Uh, there are concerns, of course. Uh, you would need to have enough liquidity. The New Zealand market that I mentioned has had very little activity in some cases. Uh, seems to me likely that if you got a well-advertised market uh, that, that had some uh, credibility behind it, that people would want to trade uh, and that there would be real differences in views. Uh, you might worry that the market could be manipulated for ideological reasons or financial reasons, uh, and that's a concern. That has not been the case as far as we can tell with the Iowa market. Uh, so I think with the research style, smaller market, that's probably less of a concern. We'd have to be very careful at how we designed a larger, more common commercial market if we were to go in that direction. There's also a concern with long time horizons. So if what we're betting over is sea level in 2100, uh, the bet is as much a function as the, of the emissions pathway and our discount rates and a variety of other phenomena. We also have to worry about, well, who's holding the security or the item, whatever it is, during this intervening period, and what are they doing with that money? So there are concerns about the long time horizons in particular, uh, the legal constraints we've talked about, and then one of my favorite words is ambiguation. I have to use that word every time I can, ambiguation. Larry Lessig, who's at Harvard Law School, used that word talking about norms, that what sometimes the way we, we overcome normative limitations is we ambiguate. Right? So here's an example. If, um, if people don't want to use motorcycle helmets, right? because not using motorcycle helmets shows that you're a risk-taking, macho guy. Right? So what do you do? You pass a law, not because you're going to enforce the law, but because you're going to ambiguate the message. And now what I can say is, Gee whiz, I have to use this because I'm law-abiding. And I've now ambiguated the question about whether or not I'm sending a social signal about whether or not I'm a, I'm a risk-seeking individual. Well, there is a concern the other way around about this. Uh, one example would be um, in one uh, study that talked about one climate uh, uh, future uh, uh, by an organization called the Foresight Exchange, the particular instrument that was discussed was how much people were willing to pay for essentially a half a meter sea level rise in 20 years. Now, I don't know about you all, I'm not a climate scientist, but I don't know many climate scientists who think we're going to get a half a meter sea level rise in 20 years. I don't think that's the mainstream, right? So the danger here is that you could end up trading these kinds of instruments, and the message could be about the trading of instruments that don't even resemble the best of the climate science. So that's a genuine concern. We have to worry about that. I don't really care what the price of a half meter sea level rises in 20 years. It's not even really relevant on some level. It's not, not in the game. But I do care whether or not the IPCC is correct about, in its various different emissions pathways, various different temperature outcomes in 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years. Okay, so that's, that's the concern about ambiguation that we, we do know exists out there. Um, there we are. So uh, we're suggesting, again, the research, uh, a research market be formed. Uh, we think there are a lot of really interesting questions that emerge when you begin to think about how you might address these concerns through a prediction market. It's the leading one I've talked about a couple of times is do conservatives trust markets or not as information signals as opposed to public um, What can we do from a legal perspective? Is the near-term option as viable as I think it is? Uh, can we begin to work toward a longer-term option? 
Uh, what are the elements of avoiding market manipulation? Uh, how do we communicate this? Will this kind of market be widely communicated? And is that message, when communicated, going to be ambiguated? Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, what do we know about whether information uh, from this market will affect beliefs and ultimately behavior as it relates to energy and climate policy? So that's uh, our suggestion. And again, all this is from the perspective of trying to understand a research and education-based market and thinking of this not as something that government ought to do, but something that private philanthropists and private organizations should think of as one of the tools they use when addressing the carbon growth curve. Thank you, and I'd like to question. Fascinating. I used to mess around in trade quite a bit. It was really interesting. But I see one of the possible limits of something like this working on major global issues is that you have a positive correlation between the number of people that are getting information from the tool with the likelihood of manipulation. In other words, as more people are using that, there's going to be a, a larger incentive for political parties or uh, supporters on either side of the global climate change issue to invest it to influence public opinion. So because of that positive correlation, I wonder, when you get to the point that it's influencing enough people's views, right. that that's going to provide so much incentive for manipulating the market. Right. And I think that's a legitimate concern. I guess the question I would have, and I, I wish I, I were an economist, I wish I knew the literature better, but is... Uh, doesn't that same phenomenon occur for the Iowa election market, and, and why does that not? Uh, why does that not seem to have been influenced in that way? But I don't think it would. I don't, how, how many people in here looked at the Iowa election market to think about who they're going to vote for? Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's well, covered by a lot of media. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, like, nobody in this room. <laughs> yeah. And the Iowa market limits how many people can. Well, that's right. That's a key difference between. That's right. And it limits the dollar amount, which, which puts some, I think, likely limit on how much people are willing to go and try to make it. So I think many of the problems, like I think the one you mentioned is a genuine problem. And I think many of those kind of problems will tend to emerge not with this prototypical argument that we're advancing, but with the broader spread of it. But ultimately, we think the broader one is probably necessary to reach the broader audience. So I think that's a very legitimate concern. And, uh, you know, there are markets where you provide regulatory oversight for a market, but I don't see how that would work here. And if you did too much of that, then people would say, oh, the regulatory oversight itself is biased on some level. So I think we would have to think about that. I don't know whether, you know, uh, again, now I'm going to get outside of my field, but I don't know whether uh, allowing puts and calls on the market would, would help a little bit, um, but, it, but I can imagine that it might. But that is definitely something we need. And if you don't mind, please uh, repeat or summarize the question for those on the phone yeah, who may not yeah, be able to hear the questions in the back. Sure. Thank you. Uh, that was a too sophisticated question for me to repeat well, uh, <laughs> but it, it was not already full of it. It was essentially, mm -hmm. uh, um, is there a, as, repeat it for me one time. Let me see if I can. If I can it's just as more people start to get information from that market, it's going to provide a greater incentive for people that want a particular right. outcome right. to invest money to influence what that market right. says. So the more influential the market becomes, the more vulnerable it is, in effect, to attracting money that has an incentive to manipulate the market. In these ways. Um, could you remove some of that by not making it a step function? So a lot, not all the intrade stuff, and I some of the other websites that do that not for money for points. Not not all of them are step functions. Some of them are some sort of the, the value of the stock is a differential between the two things. So I mean you could make it the ten year running average temperature right now, from now to the last ten years, and the ten year average thirty years ago, the differential between those is the stock price. Which would partially remove, there would be no incentive to try to sway it if it's going to have a payoff tomorrow. I see what you're saying. Right. So so, so if, if you could include an instrument of some sort that has a nearer term payoff, you may at least reduce the likelihood that someone will try to manipulate it because they'll have a fear of financial loss. Is that yeah. fair enough? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think if we could do that, if part of the whole challenge here, which is a problem with climate change more generally, of course, is a problem of time. That you care most about the long term but you kind of need near-term activity to control for some of the problems. Okay.
you know, we have existing commodities and futures and stock markets, and there are companies that have interests in climate change. I'm, I'm just wondering why some kind of index of deck builders or sunscreen manufacturers or, you know, uh, entities that would have, a, have an interest in the effects of climate change wouldn't accomplish much of what you're after and aggregate information in the same way. Yes, I think that. Um, okay, so so uh, so wouldn't a, a a an industry sector, for example, a group of dike builders or whoever they might be, have an interest in doing this? In other words, uh, could if, if this one well, way to think about this is if, if this is a good idea, you know, wouldn't the market have already responded or might it not respond? And, and I think the answer is uh, if you're thinking about uh, dike builders, et cetera, I think we do have, and, and one of those earlier slides I should, if we see some early examples. You know, in the marketplace of companies doing the things that would make us uh, think that they're signaling some of these outcomes. And so the challenge here really is to add more and more of those that have more likelihood of both getting widespread media coverage and also of actually tackling the specific issues at hand. Because one of the problems, for example, with dike builders is notice everything I focused on was anthropogenic climate change. One of the most common doubters' tools is to say, of course, climate changes all the time, and this is just not anthropogenic. And so maybe the dike builders are just better at predicting non-anthropogenic climate change. So, so we would need to make sure that those kind of phenomena didn't ambiguate the message of this market. Uh, I will use that word as often as I can. And, um, and um, but I think there is no reason why more of that shouldn't happen. And in fact, one thing that a private institution could do would be to go out and take this information and whatever information might be generated by markets, even without thinking about the specific type of market, and, and republish it, advertise it, discuss it, create a public dialogue about why are the dike builders doing that if it's not happening this way. So I guess my specific answer would be, I think what, what's different about what we're doing is that we are talking about a more precise instrument that has a higher likelihood of directly addressing some of the questions, but there is no reason why some of the kinds of markets that you're thinking about or actions by private companies might not go a long way. Sure. Mike, I think that the, if I understand what the insurance companies do, I think they already provide a mechanism for price uncertainty and signals for some of these things that we're interested in. Right. Small, small group of, of participants or players um, who are pretty sophisticated. So, so it might actually provide some, some pretty good probabilities for some of these for some of these signals. How, how is what you're proposing any different than what Munich Gray does? And how do you kind of get past the problem of, in the case of reinsurance, you have highly motivated, very sophisticated, serious players who, who aren't gaming the system, or at least it's not been interested in game for very long. Right. You know, well, one just question I have is, uh, you know, would more of that information be getting through if it weren't Munich Gray and Swiss Re doing it, if it were New York Re? Uh, and I wish that didn't matter, but I wonder if it would. I think that, um, again, I think that what happens is, unless the message is crystal clear and the, the, the item being chained, uh, traded, it is very easy for the message to get lost. And I think, for example, there are, at least in the trade press that I read, stories about when Unifree will issue a report or something like that. But you all know this, the studies. Uh, People don't read the newspaper, much less the environmental law trade press. And so I think it's very hard for companies uh, that are making these announcements to get their information to the media. There is also always a, a question about, are they acting in self-interest on some level? Are they simply trying to pump up concern in order to get greater premiums, ultimately? And so I think that the advantage of a market like this is it at least has the possibility of getting more widespread media coverage and of, uh, of somewhat undercutting the argument that this is just a corporate signal which is, is designed to reflect a narrow corporate interest as opposed to an accurate reflection of climate science. But again, I, the reason I have this slide here is because I think that is one valuable indication. And again, I think if your mindset is what does government do to communicate climate science, maybe you don't think about the value of packaging all this together and communicating it. Um, I have a question regarding, you mentioned the liquidity and uh, thin market 
being a possible problem with implementation, I'm wondering whether there's been any research to look at what kind of market participation or capitalization is required to get those moderate doubters to actually pick up and say, okay, it's not just a one-on-one -on -one bet or 200 people right. without knowing what this is actually something substantial that I should pay attention to. Right. I don't, th there may be some work done, I haven't seen it, there may be some work done on some of the, um, so what the thresholds are for this kind of behavior. I, I do think that, uh, and those of you who participate in this market can tell me, but I think that in trade actually had fairly active markets in some of this. And uh, they uh, ultimately were shut down uh, because they didn't fall into any of the legal categories that would allow them to operate moving forward, and they essentially got a cease and desist order from the CFTC. But they were, um, uh, they were sufficiently heavily traded that the, there was a widespread thought that they were doing a pretty good job. And here an example would be for this particular instrument, which was, um, you know, will 2019 be warmer 2009, there, were, there was a total volume of 232 transactions related to that particular instrument. And that seemed to have had a fairly, fairly successful function. But I don't know. I think that would be the kind of thing we'd want to say. Maybe we could see if there's a oh go ahead Jim uh, see if there's a question from anyone online. You, you can actually ask through the phone if uh, there's anyone with a question on the phone they can unmute yeah. themselves. So for those of you on the phone, uh, is there a question? Jim. Okay. Um, maybe it's just a matter of how you would structure these markets, but it it seems like there's sort of an inherent conflict. If if I think the way things are going that sea level is going to rise a certain amount or global temperatures are going to go up and so I invest or I bet on that premise and someone else, companies, people are using that as an informational source and they say wow, people out there actually believe this is going to happen, we need to do something about it and they start doing something about it, I'm going to lose my better and my investment I know, I know I, are, are you an economist by chance? No, yeah. no, if you look at my checkbook you'd be <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was asked that question uh, I, I have a student who's, a, who's about to get a PhD in law and economics and is really well trained economically and she asked me exactly that, that question but uh, and, and uh, so I do think that's a risk. I, I think, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, uh, actually taking an action that would have an effect on global carbon emissions uh, is, is so unlikely to do it at the magnitude necessary that I, I think there's a little bit of a moral hazard there. But, uh, you know, but boy, I, I kind of wish, I hope we have that problem. This is kind of where I am. I hope that people are so thinking that they might affect things that they would try to keep they would try to, what would they do? They would try to uh, act more than we would think they would in order to, to gain the benefit of the, of the bet. I guess they could go the other way, too. They could, they could bet uh, low and then try to prevent climate change policy from being adopted in order to win the, the low bet. And that, so that, that's a genuine hazard. I think, you know, that it, uh, it has not happened as far as I know in the Iowa market. It's more of a concern in a bigger market. I think the best protection for that that I know of is just that it is so hard for any one entity to move the dial on, on carbon emissions and the kind of indicators we have. Well, some of us are going to move over to Mitch's to continue the discussion, and maybe we ought to, in the interest of time, cut it off there. But let's thank Mike for, again, for